All right, let's get started. So today we're going to be, we're basically, so just to give a flavor of where we're going, um, just as a reminder, so we're on day two, basically, of sort of these likelihood-based discrete choice problems. Um, next week on Tuesday, don't forget, we don't have class on Tuesday next week. It's one of the five broken up days that are spread all throughout the semester. Um, so we don't have class on Tuesday. We will have class on Thursday. Um, don't ask me why it's that way. I didn't choose to make it that way. Um, so no class Tuesday, then we'll have class Thursday. Um, what we're going to be doing is um, effectively the, the system, what we have left is two more days on this. So next week, we're going to talk about duration models. And then I'm going to talk about shrinkage estimators and more generally hierarchical modeling. Then we're going to kind of pivot. So we'll kind of have finished talking about um, kind of structural, uh, kind of laying the groundwork. And what we're going to do is start talking about kind of research design methods. So that's kind of where we're going. Part of what today is, is to kind of lay the groundwork for some of that discussion that we're going to do when we start talking about multiple um, IVs. But also more generally, I want to kind of expose you to these methods. So. So the, already. So um, today what we're going to be talking about is we're really going to be doing discrete, more discrete choice modeling, but thinking about multiple choice. So, you know, discrete choices where we're allowed more than two choices. Um, and we're going to basically expand the set of choices. And what that's going to do is it's going to really create, um, it creates a whole new set of challenges, but also kind of rich structure that is um, really pretty powerful and interesting. Um, a lot of what we're going to do today is going to feel very IO adjacent. So what I mean by that is like industrial organization adjacent. Um, you know, the language we're going to use is going to be very, um, it's going to sound like we're just talking about demand system estimation. A lot of that is because most of the ideas that are set up here and have been thought out of by people who are working on IO type problems, like I have a... I have five types of cereal. How do I choose between which cereal I want and their characteristics and how do people choose on these things? I, I think that these things are still really powerful. And I actually happen to think that these, so these approaches and these ideas are really underused in broader applied settings because historically they haven't really been there and sort of the data and computational techniques weren't really available. Now I think we have this a huge amount of data and a huge amount of computing power. We have really kind of effective ways of thinking about putting a lot more structure um, or trying to think about the actual individual choices that are going on. In some ways, kind of the ideas that are in these IO, this IO literature are kind of waiting to be unlocked in a lot of other applications. Um, I kind of know by selection that most of you are not IO people because this happens to be at the same time as the IO class. So it's almost by selection. So think of this as like an opportunity to potentially arbitrage or use some of these techniques in the fields that you are interested in. Um, and hopefully by the end of today, you'll at least kind of have an um, exposure to a couple of these topics in a way that might be useful, um, at least get you thinking about these topics. So the problems that we're gonna discuss today are effectively, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about the, the following four types of ideas. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about Kind of the most important one that we'll talk about, which is one I'm sure you've heard of, which is the independence of irrelevant alternatives, so or IIA. We're going to talk about the problem of choice sets and consideration sets. Um, we're going to touch base on the idea of like the inconsistency of fixed effects and what happens if you aren't able to estimate fixed effects. And then um, we'll also talk a little bit about just how do you deal with unobserved heterogeneity in these settings. Okay. So let's just set up some um, notation here. So the way to think about this is that we're going to be thinking about there being choices that we observe from people. So there are capital J choices or J plus one choices that are in some set omega. We're going to just label them by you know zero to J, but the ordering is irrelevant. Right, so we're just using this as a convenient way to think about the, the choices. There isn't some element to which one is bigger than zero or two is bigger than one. They're just an ordering in which there's the multiple dimensions aspect of these, of these choices. 
you know, uh, the, the kind of canonical example that I'll keep referring back to is kind of red bus, blue bus, blue bus and car are kind of the three examples. You have a choice of what form of transportation you're going to take. And notationally, a lot of times we'll refer to three types of characteristics. There'll be individual characteristics, which are going to be invariant to choices. So this could be like your income level. There'll be choice characteristics. So the most important one that we'll talk about is like the price. Um, and then there'll be individual by choice characteristics that could matter. Um, this is kind of the simplest one that you'll allow for is the idea that you could allow, you could just interact it with fixed effects. So the characteristic could kind of have differing levels of importance depending, depending on which choice it is. So it's, you know, income by red bus, income by blue bus, income by car. Um, and then the obvious thing is right when j is equal to one, we're back to our, our multinomial logit setting where we, we were just studying last week. So recall that, so this is, I kind of pushed this idea on you guys last time. There's basically two ways to think about the discrete choice problem. They are not mutually exclusive ways of thinking about it, but one is a statistical view, which is just saying, how do we view model the classification of a particular choice? So in the binary choice problem, um, there's really only one parameter that needs to be known, right? Which is this pi, which is the probability that you choose choose something conditional on the characteristics, um, and obviously the you know the other parameter or the the other choice is just one minus that because the probability sum up. When there's more than two choices, the dimensionality becomes more complicated because if you start to think about this. You have, so I actually notationally did a bad job here, but you know, you have three choices, say, and you have the characteristics not just of yourself, but you have the characteristics for all three products. And so there's this question of in the two choice case, it's always a relative statement of it's one good relative to another or one choice relative to another. But in the two choice setting, how do you think about the choice of choice three? versus for, uh, choice two or versus choice one, how is the kind of relative comparison being done? And in a fully non-parametric way, you kind of have to start taking a stance on how you compare the relative effects of these things. So the simplest version of this that'll come up is think about the idea of, all right, say I want to be super, inflex uh, super flexible, and I'm thinking about the choice of choosing between red bus, blue bus, and car. Well, when I think about the choice, do I think about the price of other goods affecting my choice um, in, in, in making a decision about whether or not I take a card? If I take the car choice, is it just a function of the price relative to the other two choices? And how do I make that comparison? How do I kind of con construct a single measure that compares across these? So when we did the binary one, we constructed a single index. How do we do this in the multiple choice? And how to parameterize this? So most of the models that we're going to do today are going to do very particular um, restrictions on how the choices affect one another, and it's not going to be innocuous. It actually matters quite a bit um, on how this stuff works. Any questions on that? Okay. Yeah? Did somebody say something? No. Okay. Um, so what I wanted to start with before we jump into the models is to think about a kind of simple thing. So, which is say we're not interested in becoming IO economists and we just wanna think about treatment effects. I think it's worth highlighting kind of what problems show up in these multiple choice settings. I know this is a big wall of text, I'm sorry. Um, you know, one thing that we would want is imagine we have something we think is randomly assigned and we're interested and we have multiple choices and we're interested in understanding what the effects are of this treatment on the choices. So we have some randomly assigned treatment T on J choices and we could ask for the effect of the treatment on the probability that you choose some choice J, right? That's a very easy probability. You say, look, what share of people chose it under the treatment versus under the control? We know how to calculate that. That's an easy average treatment effect to calculate. That is making a very particular um, assumption on the estimate of interest, right? Which is saying, what's the probability that I choose J relative to all other choices, right? 
And the problem is, is that, you know, there starts to be a, you start to notice that obviously you can't, you know, that's a particular comparison that you're making. It's saying, if you do that for every outcome, the obvious sum of the treatment effects would be summing to exactly zero. That's just because they all have to sum up. The problem is in that estimating a, estimating this type of model is that we know a lot less about the substitution patterns patterns of individuals. They so can be very helpful. Um, basically, if you're faced with a lot of choices, you can basically say, all right, let me think about the effect on one particular margin. So uh, a good example of this shows up in my own work in bankruptcy. So we have some way to induce random variation in the leniency of a judge. And we can ask basically, um, you know, the leniency measure, we can ask the extent to which it induces on one margin. But the judge can actually do multiple things. They can choose to dismiss, they can discharge, they can convert the case. They can also, um, there's like one other thing that they can potentially do, but there's four potential outcomes. The one that we really cared about for our outcome was discharge. And so what we did was it was discharge relative to everything else. And so we had a simple binary measure. It was straightforward to kind of think about the treatment effects, but that is a, a simplification relative to the, the substitution patterns. And so what we wouldn't be able to do, for example, is we can't say the probability of one choice conditional on choosing one or two. That would basically be conditioning on a dependent variable, right? So there's a conditional probability you might be interested in, which is what's the probability of I conditional on choosing I or J? And you can't do that in this, in this setting because you can't condition on the outcome variable per se because of the, the relevant substitution pattern. We don't have enough structure on the probability space um, under this non-parametric modeling. So it's really a question of what's the counterfactual question you're interested in. So, you know, if you're interested in asking how does changing one of the X I J affect the probability of choosing choice J relative to all of the choices, that's something we can do with what we just talked about on the last slide. So, you know, there's this question of, um, you know, the, you can basically just estimate exactly that binary outcome and that's easy. You could, you know, if you want to ask, how does changing one of the X, I, J affect the probability of choosing choice J relative to choice I, that becomes much more complicated and we need more structure on this. Does it, is it clear why that's the case, right? It's because if you want to ask the question of what's the probability conditional on choosing both, you have to know the marginal probability and then be able to divide that by this joint probability of choosing one and two. And the problem is, is the way that you've defined the probability of choosing J is relative to choosing J versus everything else. Let me maybe write that down so that it's a little clearer. I should have put it in the slides, but I sort of ran out of time on this. So we can talk about the probability that yi equals j for like this. So actually, the best way to do it is imagine, define a new outcome, call it y2i, which is equal to yi uh, equals j. So that's saying, let me put this on here, sorry. So it's basically saying, actually notationally, let me just do it. So yij is saying, did you choose choice j over, and so if you didn't choose this, that's the same thing. So yij equals zero is the same thing as saying that yi equals basically the choice set minus j, right? Every, you chose one of everything else, or you could have cho chosen anything other than j. Well, the point is, is that if what you want to ask is the question of, you know, what's the probability of yi equals j conditional on yi um, equals j or, oops, sorry, or, it's not programming, yi equals k, the issue is, is that the probabilities that we've defined are all relative to the 
to the wrong choice space. You're not going to be able to divide by the joint probability. You'd have to sort of set up a new probability estimate um, in order to get that. So you can't measure the, the choice substitution in quite the same way. So it's really a function of trying to think about what is the counterfactual question that you're interested in. If you're interested in relative choices, that can be um, much more straightforward. And then a last counterfactual that you're potentially interested in is at how does adding or subtracting one of the choices change the, the choice probability? So sometimes that can be a relevant thing, right? You want to know if I have a new product or a new choice, how does that affect the, the relative market shares across these things? Um, in, in a lot of the, you know, the question is, is like, under what settings are these estimands identified? And the ones that we're going to do, they definitely are. I mean, one and two for sure. Um, they, they are potentially heavily driven by the parametric assumptions we're going to make. Um, if you're interested in kind of understanding more when you can identify these things and when you can't, you should see this Barry and Hale um, annual review of economics article where they just show that kind of there's two specific conditions need to be hold on the structure of the problem, but it allows you to put very general structure on the distribution of the shocks. You can kind of non-parametrically talk about the identification. You just have to make the biggest thing that you have to do is you have to talk about there being um, a way of converting the characteristics into a single index. So the way for us, right, is that there's some utility function, UIJ, where the UIJ, what you're doing is kind of comparing utilities where the utilities are linear um, in the characteristic. So the way that the, the McFadden, so this is how multiple choice this kind of um, conditional, uh, conditional logit model is set up. It says, think about this as a structural choice problem where we have um, a latent index, which is indexed by these UIJs. This is the underlying utilities for each good where the, the product that you're choosing or the choice that you're choosing is the choice that maximizes the utility. It's the J amongst all of your UIJs that maximizes in your choice set. So if person I chooses J, it's because it's the choice that maximizes utility amongst all their choices. And obviously this is you know, very similar to that Y I star in the binary case that we did last class. So the key point is that if you're willing to assume that yij or uij is equal to this um, linear index plus this epsilon term, so we have this additive structure here, and that the epsilon ijs are independent across choices and individuals and are iid type one, you get this Mc, McFadden model, so which is that looks hopefully exactly like the logit model. But what you have now is you're summing up over all the choices in the denominator and everything else looks pretty similar. Yeah, any questions so far? This should look familiar to you guys. So in a lot of cases, um, a key parameter that we're interested in is a price elasticity. So here it's gonna be a price elasticity. There might be some other parameter or covariate we're interested in. We're gonna be talking about the price because that's so common in IO. Um, but there's reason to believe it could be lots of different things. Um, so then a key variable um, that you're going to pay attention to and we'll let it have a separate term as a result is this PJ, which is going to, it's the price that varies across different products. And so what you can write down is we'll write down the marginal probability of choice J is equal to the, um, the price times gamma plus Xij times beta summed up over um, these different exponentiated terms. What you can do is you can talk about price elasticities is really, you know, if you remember your, your micro classes is the price elasticity, you remember is the derivative of the choice function. So it's the derivative of this measure times the price over the, the share, basically the market share or the probability that you're going to do it. This is fine. This is not very different. What potentially you kind of notice here is that this looks almost identical to what we did when we did um, thinking about average, um, average derivatives. So remember, we were looking in the logic model, it was challenging to interpret what the coefficients meant. Well, what you ended up getting was you got a very similar relationship to here, where um, these elasticities kind of give you 
an interpretable measure for any of the coefficients. So this is, when you take this derivative, this is gonna basically pop out gamma as part of this, and you're gonna end up getting the elasticity with respect to price. What's more meaningful in this and much more relevant is that you can think about cross elasticities, cross price elasticities in this. So what that is, is you can call that epsilon JK, and then you take the derivative of choosing J with respect to the price of K times the price of K over um, the, uh, the, the probability of choosing J. So what's the, what's the sign on this, right? So if the, another product increases its price, my basically my market share should go up, right? The probability of choosing J if the price of K goes up should go up as well. Like, or rather the, the probability of choosing it should go up because there's gonna be a substitution in that direction. Um, so, um, oh, I have a negative sign floating around here for whatever reason. Um, so a key issue with this formulation of the conditional logit model, this is where we're getting into the independence of irrelevant alternatives, is that the cross elasticities are identical. So the substitution pattern between J and K and L and K are gonna be identical. So basically saying that if you shift the probability um, of, uh, what do we call it? If you shift the probability of or the price of good K, it's going to move the 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 probab the percentage change in the market share for good J is going to be identical to the percentage change for the good in um, for a good L. It's a basically an identical proportionate shift. The substitution patterns are mimicked across this, and the way you, way you can see that is if you can just solve for this when you plug in. Um, with the derivatives for um, the conditional logit model, you'll get basically if you take this um, cross partial of the conditional logit model, what you end up getting is you get a, a proper, a basically a value, which is it's going to be gamma times the probability of good J times the probability of good K times the price of K over um, the probability of good J. Those are going to cancel, and all you're going to get left with are things that vary as a function of. Um, product K. So really it doesn't, it's irrespective of um, characteristics about J, you're going to get the same um, uh, product J effect. So hence it's going to be identical for all other products. Another way of thinking about this is that if you look at the probability of choosing J, conditional on choosing just J and K, that you get Oh, this should be it. This is a typo. Sorry. There, there's basically the probability of choosing J conditional on what we were just talking about of J and K. That's going to be equal to the exponentiated XI J beta over exponentiated XI J beta exponentiated XI K beta. And notice here that basically none of the other choices show up in this probability choice, no matter how similar the choices are to J and K. So in other words, if you tweak one of the characteristics of a different product that could be nearly identical to J or K, that the relative share between J and K is gonna remain identical, right? So conditional on choosing those two, the, the marginal changes are gonna be the same. So the canonical example of this is in um, this car red bus, blue bus example. So presumably a person who's taking red and blue buses is indifferent between red and blue buses, blue, blah, red and blue buses and if they have the same price. Now, if there's an increase in the red bus price, presumably this is going to cause a huge substitution into blue buses rather than a shift into car users. And what this basically says, though, is that the conditional logic model is not going to account for this. You're basically going to get proportionate shifts into the other two products, hence the term independence of irrelevant alternatives, where you're not going to get a substitution pattern that makes sense as you shift characteristics of one product versus the other. Any questions on this so far? 
So how should we deal with this? So there are a number of ways to potentially deal with it. So there's kind of two ways in which we want to deal with this or can think about dealing with this. One is that this is purely from an economic standpoint, we have an intuition about how markets substitute across one another. And we don't think that identical cross elasticities make sense. And the second is that it's also a statistical problem. There's basically, we've imposed a very strong functional form, which was analytically extremely convenient, but has these very perverse properties, um, which basically affect the way that we're gonna generate counterfactuals. Um, it's gonna put a lot of symmetry in our counterfactuals. It's not, it's particularly parametric. It's not very flexible. So we're gonna talk about two ways to solve these types of issues. So the ways that people think about solving these types of problems, the first set are kind of thinking about our kind of direct ways of targeting these error structures, which are called um, nested logit and correlated multivariate probit. And then the other is these random coefficient logit models. And there are ways to actually nest the two of them together, but these are typically relatively distinct um, approaches. So, One view um, of the intuition for this problem comes from the independence of the epsilons across the choices. So mm -hmm. they're independent, not just across people, but also across choices, right? So not, we're, we have J times N independent draws of our logic term. And these epsilons basically rationalize seeing non-zero choices in both directions. It's basically a way of rationalizing the choice probabilities, right? It's effectively, if one thing seems very, very preferred to the other based on characteristics, you're still potentially seeing a little bit of choice on one. And so these epsilons allow to basically rationalize a certain amount of market share. Effectively though, if you think about the red bus, blue bus example, um, getting two new draws of the epsilons for buses is not potentially an intuitive view of bus demand, right? Instead, the blue and red bus likely have very correlated epsilon draws, if not identical, right? So that's the statistical point is that really what it is is that there's this arbitrary distinction between two types of buses where the preference model kind of suggests that they should be very similar in their choice preference. And of course, the question becomes, well, what is the correlation within those sets? So with the nested logit approach, you can identify sets. So we actually specify them beforehand. They're not data-driven. And then you allow data-driven measures to, you can basically allow for data-driven data -driven measures of correlation of the epsilon within those sets. So kind of think about this as when we define discrete buckets in which we think things are nested or correlated. So in the context of the car and the buses, we would say, we're gonna allow the buses to have correlated epsilons. And then we'll allow the cars and the bus groups to be independent from one another. And this is basically gonna help preserve the simple logit structure. We'll have this nested logit. Um, Penny Goldberg actually has a paper from 1995 that shows kind of an example application. Um, what this is going to do is it's going to allow for this kind of correlation. The problem is, is that the estimation uh, approach gets a little more challenging. Um, it's non-trivial. You can't directly estimate it with ML without run, potentially running into some issues. But the key thing is that you can use the data to measure what the correlation is. So that's very nice. So you have to specify what the sets are, but it's going to give you back a measure of how correlated the choices are within those sets. Um, so that's one way to kind of deal with this IIA problem. A second way, which is a little more direct, um, and it doesn't require the researcher to specify these choices, is to use this multivariate probit approach. So, you know, since we are, we kind of already said what the issue is, right? We know that, well, it's these epsilons, we have potentially J choices. Well, what we want is we want to say, all right, imagine we were doing probit. We know that there are these error terms in the standard probit 
version, like what we were just describing, we were, we were setting all the off diagonals equal to zero. But instead is we could allow them to be correlated to some matrix sigma in this multivariate choice model. And we want to directly estimate that sigma. Now, the issue is, is that with many choices, the parameter space grows at a quadratic rate. So that becomes, if you completely unrestricted, that can become quite challenging. But there are ways to kind of do this that will let, let you basically back out what the correlation is and you don't have to pre-specify what the nested structure is. So this is, in my view, this kind of approach strictly dominates the, the nested logit one in the way, in the sense that this is going to kind of allow much more general um, correlation across these structures. But the key downside of it is that you have to do a lot more estimation work to kind of do these approaches. So the, the papers to look at if you're interested in this, so McCulloch, uh, McCulloch, Pelson, and Rossi talk about how to do this in a Bayesian setting. So if you're willing to be Bayesian about this, it becomes much more straightforward because you can set up um, basically uh, something where you can use Gibbs sampler to, so for the, we're gonna talk about this hopefully, um, but the idea is that we, there are simulation methods in a Bayesian setting that are very tractable and very easy to compute. And if you wanna do this in a, in a non-Bayesian setting, there are simulation approaches in, in Ken Train's book that help deal with exactly how to estimate this in different settings. Uh, Peter Hall in his job market paper has a very nice application of using these types of models where you want to allow for this type of correlation when specifically thinking about um, ambulances, basically thinking about um, ambulances and where people get sent to in, the, in this structure. Um, so I would say that this kind of, this approach is going to strictly dominates the nested one specifically because of this fact that the researcher is not required to kind of choose the nested approach, choose the nested. So that was one way to kind of deal with this IIA approach. So one way to deal with it was this aspect of um, just, we know that there's issues with the epsilons in terms of this fact that we're allowing them to be strictly independent. What if we try to just deal with that directly an alternative way to do this is to say, okay, well, let's make it so that the epsilons don't do so much work for rationalizing our substitution patterns. So let's allow for more unobserved heterogeneity to drive the substitution patterns in such a way that it rationalizes what we're, rationalizes what we're seeing. So basically by adding more variation in epsilon ij that's driven by things in our data, this is going to allow for a richer substitution pattern. So to kind of extend what we had before, imagine now we have the same model, so our utilities are driven the same way, but instead of there being a fixed beta for every person, we're allowing this to vary across people in a random way, in a way that we don't observe. This is the direct analogy here, um, if you've seen this before, this is a random coefficients model, so this shows up also in panel settings, for example. It's the idea that we just, there's heterogeneity in, in preferences for certain types of products and goods, etc., and they have different there's substantial heterogeneity there. What's nice is that once you allow for this is you can rewrite it and say, okay, well, the utility is really based off of some mean beta. And then the error term has these two pieces, this epsilon, which is identical to before, but then we have this distributional term. So this beta I minus beta bar, what you do, and so the way, there are a lot of ways to potentially estimate this, but the simplest one is to say, all right, well, imagine these betas are drawn from a normal distribution how, or from some discrete distribution. There are four types of people. We're not sure exactly what they are, but we want to estimate them. There are different ways of kind of allowing for that type of heterogeneity that are then going to give you more substitution pattern that's going to be richer and allow you to vary this and then talk about, well, what would happen in markets where there were, if we shifted the price, for example. Basically, it's if you, you know, not to sound crude about it, but the, the, the cheat is that you're effectively making A to I be much richer, right? There's a more richness in this that the epsilon IJ doesn't have to do as much work. And really, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of yada yada the the hard part, right? In the sense, not to, like in the, the Seinfeld sense of it, it's like, 
so write down the model, yada, yada, you get results. The yada, yada is kind of the most important part in terms of setting up the estimation process here. Um, McFadden and Train kind of have a nice discussion of it. This is kind of the reason why this stuff is hard in these IO settings is not purely off the shelf. You have to set up your maximum likelihood estimation and actually do the work to do this estimation rather than it just being something you plug in directly um, in a lot of settings. There's some things that are off the shelf in Stata now because this is such, so default, but in a lot of settings, you have to kind of write down the model yourself um, and talk about these choices. Does that make sense to people so far? Any questions? Okay. So now we're gonna kind of get into things that I think are interesting. Um, and I wanna kind of highlight, cause I think there are interesting problems that show up in a lot of settings that could be useful um, for work that you wanna do in the future. So there's this concept, which I only recently learned kind of the terminology for, which is called symmetric unobserved product differentiation. So what you can view this epsilon view, uh, epsilon term is basically, it's an unobserved valuation of some product characteristic. Um, so, or you could, you don't have to call it a product if you're not thinking in IO space, it doesn't have to be a serial product. It could be any kind of choice, right? So it could be the doctor that you choose to go to. It could be the real estate agent you work with. It could be, you know, what investment, um, mutual fund you invest in. So there's some kind of unobserved component of this that we're using as a way to try and fit the fact that we can't perfectly explain what's going on in terms of who chooses what. That makes sense. I mean, it's the same thing as these epsilons when we're trying to fit a line of best fit, right? Um, and most models that we've looked at have this kind of symmetric unobserved product difference, it's SUPD. This is coming from this paper by Ackerberg and, and Reisman. Um, the issue that comes up in here, and we've kind of talked about this a little bit in terms of the IIA problem, but there's, there's actually this really interesting aspect of, think about now adding products, which is kind of interesting. So if you think about adding another bus product, the intuition of what we think is going on, right, is we think that the adding of another pro bus product in the space should crowd the original bus, the original bus market share, right? So we have some space in which um, products are living and all of a sudden we add another product in. The idea is that, well, buses should kind of compete rather than being kind of in their own space that's independent. And the problem with most of the, with symmetric unobserved product differentiation is that it doesn't allow for the aspect that these new things that are being put in are highly correlated in terms of what people's choices um, about them are. So it's really any counterfactual where you think about adding new choices, this is gonna be um, essentially a serious issue because if you basically think about XI is defining this characteristic space or XIJ is defining a characteristic space, when you add a new product to that space, so it can be very similar, say they have very similar aspects, similar price, similar number of wheels, similar length, et cetera, that you think that they should crowd one another when you start allowing for logit errors or that those logit errors effectively create a lot of space um, in that characteristic space relative um, to the existing products because you get a new draw that's independent. So all these things that we talked about previously, we're trying to deal with those but in the end, they all have to have some amount of logit in them. There's some amount of logit that exists in those spaces that automatically creates this distance. So Ackerberg and Reisman propose a solution that kind of uh, gives a way to incorporate the number of choices directly. And a lot of these um, papers that think about the question of adding a new product, if you're interested in the counterfactual of, I wanna add a new product. So imagine I'm, you know, I'm a finance professor, so I'm gonna think about this. Imagine you were a person and you use these tools to think about um, retail investor products that were being offered to them. And you wanted to understand what the counterfactual effect was of adding a new type of real estate, uh, a retail investor product. And you had some model of how people chose in this space. Well, when you think about the counterfactual of adding a new product, you really wanna take this piece seriously because you wanna think about how do they crowd out one another? 
And so this Ackerberg and Reisman paper kind of um, proposes a solution. It's not perfect, um, but it's a way of kind of directly addressing this issue. Um, the symmetry of our errors also plays a really important point, and we're going to address this next, which is this idea of, you know, if you think about the cross price elasticities, logit implies that the elasticity of i and j should be equal to j and i. The substitution pattern should be the same there. Any questions on that? Sorry, before I move on. Okay. Okay. Um, so, so far, we basically assume that all individuals uh, use the same choices, have the same choices. And there are a lot of reasons why that would not be the case, right? So attention, knowledge, opportunity. There are a lot of reasons to think why the choices that we sort of see as the econometrician might not be the same that you consider as the consumer or as you know, whatever you want to define as the unit of analysis. So the subset of choices that a consumer focuses on are what are called the consideration sets. So I don't know if there are any marketing PhDs here or DBAs here, but the, um, this is like a big deal in the marketing literature. Because if you think about it, part of the role of marketing is to help consumers understand what's in their consideration set in the first place, right? So if you think about the role that marketing does, part of it presumably is to tell you, hey, I know you were only considering these K goods, but there's another good that you should add to that consideration set so that you're making this decision. Um, that's at least one part of it. But um, more interestingly is like this subsetting of thinking about the consideration set becomes very important if we're interested in thinking about um, changing goods that are offered. So the kind of the problem is if we assert the consideration set to the full choice set for all individuals, when we see individuals choose those certain goods, we're going to view that as reflecting their underlying preferences, right? So, I mean, it's a function of how seriously we take these models, but right now, the way that we view it is that, you know, if there's a, we're viewing these as reflecting preferences or choices um, in some meaningful way. And so as a consequence, the counterfactual we generate from this model would imply a certain type of response. So for example, if I never considered going to Harvard in my choice set for college, for example, a change in its price is not gonna be relevant for me. And so even if they massively lower their price and I still choose to not go there, in a model in which the choice set is equal to the consideration set, that would be a model that says, well, I really don't like or don't wanna to go to Harvard versus what might be the right consider the right way to model it is to say I just never thought about it in my consideration set in the first place and as a consequence um, it's the counterfactual you generate where say you informed me about Harvard would have a very different implication than um, something else that you do so the changes in the consider in the characteristics if those affect your considerations that this can have important implications for your counterfactual that makes sense to people sort of understand the idea of that. I mean, it's not that hard to think about, right? We like live with the internet at our fingertips. There's a million products for every choice that we do. And then we only have a subset of things that we see or choose between when we do stuff. The kind of the general way to think about consideration sets is to think about um, the, the probability of choosing any one product J. So conditional on a set of prices uh, P is the sum over uh, the consideration sets that include choice J times the probability that you get that consideration set given these prices times the probability of choosing choice J conditional on your consideration set. So all this is saying is like, it's a two-step process, right? First, there's a probability of some observing some consideration set in the data, there's some probability of that. Conditional on that, you choose things in a normal kind of standard choice way. Right, so you have the set of consideration sets, the overall choice probability, um, the probability of that, and the choice of J within that. The, the key thing that happens here, and this is gonna be relevant for this paper we're about to discuss by um, 
by Jason Abeluk and, and Adams and Prassel is that the, this type of modeling can break the symmetry of the choice elasticities. So if you think about this, right, is that if I'm only, there's always gonna be symmetry within the consideration set, but the simplest way to think about it is that say I'm only considering my own, I say what we're gonna have is called like the default. So I always stick with my own thing. So this is like us with our cell phone plan, for example. Like we don't really shop around. We're kind of in defaulted into this one choice. If the price of my good changes a lot, if it goes up by 50%, then all of a sudden I might consider a bigger set of things. I might say, okay, let me explore all options. And then I'm gonna sort of substitute, I'll have a new consideration set and I'll substitute between those. However, the flip, which is kind of the cross other version of the cross elasticity. So say I, the price goes up and so then I substitute into a new phone. Alternatively, though, under this default thing where I'm only thinking about myself, my, the, problem, the, the plan I'm in now is to say, well, imagine that competitor that I would have liked drops their price by 30, 40% or whatever the sort of the cross elasticity you wanna do. That, cross elasticity is not gonna equal because, because it's not in my consideration set, I'm not even looking at it. I don't notice that the price falls. And so I don't substitute towards that product in the same way. And so as a consequence, you have this asymmetry um, between the choices that happens. Um, basically, if, uh, you know, from there is, is they, this is exactly the same statement. Our identification result, this is the bias that comes from ignoring consideration sets, which is to say our identification result builds on the insight that imperfect consideration breaks symmetry between cross price responses or more generally cross characteristic responses. There's no reason necessarily to care exclusively just about prices. For example, in a model with a default, Symmetry would ordinarily, ordinarily require that switching decisions be equally responsive to the decrease, increase of a price of a default good by 100 or decrease in the price of all rival goods by 100. Suppose instead that con consumers are inattentive and choose the default option unless that good becomes sufficiently unsuitable. Now switching decisions will be unresponsive to changes in the pri price of rival goods, but, but very responsive to changes in the price of the default, such uh, to the degree that they disturb or perturb attention. So then a, I do a little dot, dot, dot. And our framework implies that ad hoc attempts to model consideration sets um, will still yield misspecified models because they don't relax the symmetry assumption. So the idea is that without taking this seriously, um, you're going to get misspecified models. Now, the question is, is like, is that going to be a big deal for the counterfactuals you care about? Maybe. Um, but it can matter a lot in certain types of settings. So this paper basically considers um, two really, it, so it's really considering non-parametric estimation of this with a, a nice application. But, and the paper I'm referring to is this um, 2020 Abeluk and Adams Prassel paper, um, where, you know, they consider two types of models. One is the default one we were just talking about where there's a base default that you focus on and ignore other choices. So if you're interested in consumer problems, that's pretty common, right? So health insurance is the one that they're focused on. You can have a, um, a more rich setting where you put a little bit of structure on how a choice is selected into the consideration set. Basically what they show is that you don't need additional data to get at this. You can identify the consideration choice probabilities by using price elasticity, specifically by exploiting this asymmetry in the, in the price elasticities, right? So given the defaults and the price elasticity, price elasticities, if you have enough variation that you're identifying you know, a change in the price on the rival good versus the change in the price in the default good, you can exploit both of these pieces to get at both the consideration choice model as well as the choice within the consideration set. Um, so this can be really important to model. I happen to think that it's like very interesting and very important um, in a lot of choice problems, but it's particularly important if your counterfactual relates to changes in the consideration set or if you're interested in those types of things. So you know, if you're a person working on behavioral finance kind of questions and you're thinking about how people don't pay attention to certain types of things, this can be potentially very important. Any questions on this?
O sea, I just kind of want to highlight this. Um, I didn't really get into it in part. I just felt like it was kind of beyond the scope of what is relevant, but I just want you to sort of know what's going on in this. Um, I've noticed this is showing up more and more in finance papers that people are using these types of models. And I find that it seems like people are acting as if it's something magical. So I want people to at least be familiar with what this is. So one set of models, this, think of this as purely another way of generating additional variation in, um, in the choice substitution patterns. So remember previously, you know, we had these, these IJ and we were allowed for the beta I and the XIJ. So that was gonna allow for more variation in the epsilons. This is a set of models that what it does is it is allowing for the sort of the additional setting, which is to say, imagine we have multiple markets where the markets are segmented. So the idea is to say like, look, when we're thinking about the, the choice of cereal products in New York City, it doesn't affect the choice of cereal products in San Francisco. So you get variation across these things in terms of it. And you obviously have to have variation in these types of things. More generally, the idea that markets are segmented in some meaningful way um, when it comes to consumer demand. And, then, and specifically that there's heterogeneity in the demand for products as a consequence of this segmentation, or not as a consequence, in addition to this segmentation. Um, so what this, so now this M here is indexing different markets. So we observe data, for example, of across goods and markets. And all this is really doing is allowing for now more unobserved heterogeneity where we have this psi JM, which is, you can think of effectively as a, um, a product fixed effect and or a market fixed effect, unobservable um, heterogeneity in the demand for products across these places. Then what this is gonna do is um, this approach, oh, I didn't sort of go into it, but basically the estimation procedure here is, becomes more complicated because what you're gonna do is you're gonna do an iterated fixed point to try and back out these types of fixed effects um, in order to be able to estimate these models. You need to basically, you can estimate the beta bar in the same way. We're gonna have the same sort of beta bar and the beta I term goes into the, the, um, the, the error term, but you can estimate these models. And the trick is you just have to account for this, um, this unobserved component. And the way you'll do that is, is basically through this uh, fixed point algorithm. It's really gonna allow, think of this model as just a way for allowing both for more, um, a richer substitution pattern. And additionally, it's going to allow for potentially unobserved heterogeneity that might bias your results. Um, let me in the last couple of minutes, just talk about this is kind of switching gears a little bit, but it, while we're in the discrete choice setting, I wanted to emphasize this because this is something that comes up and I think not everyone gets exposed to this. Um, one issue that basically arises in these nonlinear, so think about binary choice or multivariate choice, whatever mm -hmm. setting, is that um, many features don't carry over from the linear model. So I already said this last time is that like the compli it's complicated to interpret coefficients, right? You have to do more work to kind of understand what they mean. You take the average derivative or you think about, um, you think about uh, generating counterfactuals such that they're interpretable. Whereas in the linear model, you can kind of just interpret it as like, bang, the coefficient means X percent increase, um, X percentage point increase. Um, a bigger issue in terms of like, what like this can actually cause serious issues in your coefficients is not just about interpretation, comes from things like fixed effects or specifically the inconsistency of fixed effects estimates. So think about like a panel fixed effects model with binary choice. So the outcome is some binary choice over time, just for the purpose of this. And there are many ways to kind of change this, but the panel setting is the canonical one where what you're doing is you're allowing for some individual fixed effects. So we have a person I over time with individual fixed effects and then some beta that we want to estimate. So this is a panel setting, right? And this is the linear model, which we're very, very familiar with. And you can run this and you can run this and have um, fixed effects and estimate um, beta as a function of this. 
versus there's a version of this that you could run that is doing this with logit right where we're going to model this where we have some index model where it's alpha i plus xit beta right and it's a function of how you shift it the trick is is that alpha i is not observed it's an individual fixed effect that's fixed over time right so it's basically saying like, what's the propensity of someone to do something people are allowed to have different like baseline levels in their propensity to do something is this clear to everyone? I know I sort of jumped to sort of showing this. Does this make sense, everyone? You should chime in if this is not clear to what it means. Okay, so an issue that comes up. So in this setting, what we would call alpha i is a nuisance parameter. Remember how we talked about nuisance parameters? We don't care about the alpha i, we care about the beta. Alpha I, we need to know though, so that we can estimate beta consistently. The key point is that if we have a short panel, if we only observe a few observations per person, so like three time periods, four time periods, we're not gonna be able to estimate alpha I, right? Alpha I is basically the mean for that person. And with four time periods, you can't estimate a mean value of that person. There's, that dummy variable is gonna pick up the mean that it can pick up with four observations, but it's not consistent in any meaningful way. It's, it's super noisy. So what's notable is that in the linear model case, and this is why everyone uses the linear model, this alpha I, the fact that it's inconsistent doesn't matter. This is kind of a hugely important feature of linear models is that even with short time periods, you can plug this in, you'll have an inconsistent estimate of alpha I, but you'll still estimate beta consistently irrespective of the, um, the nuisance parameters consistency. The problem is that in these nonlinear models where you're all doing say like a probit, if alpha i is not estimated consistently, you won't be able to estimate beta consistently. The exception to that rule is for the conditional logit. So Gary Chamberlain, um, has these two papers, one in 1987 and then another one in, in 2010 that basically shows that for the binary outcome case where this F is this distribution that you're doing for the index, the only model that consistently estimates um, beta is the conditional logit. It's like a, that, and that's specifically with respect to like a, oh shoot, sorry, oh boy, oh boy, sorry. Um, with respect to these individual fixed effects. So it's a, if you basically what you end up doing, you end up integrating out the individual fixed effect in a way that you can estimate the XIT. There's a special way that you can do it by conditioning um, on the outcome. More generally though, what I want you to remember from this, this is, I want to like burn this into your brain because this is the most important thing. So this is, if you haven't been paying attention in all class, this is the one thing that I want you to take away from this is that, when we have a binary outcome and we're thinking about fixed effects that we need fixed effects. So forget about the panel setting, but say we have something where we need to put in dummies in order to have strict ignorability. And we're interested in estimating a treatment effect. So say we need to put in zip code fixed effects, for example, we don't believe our estimate otherwise. If those zip code fixed effects aren't consistently estimated, which means like we don't have a lot of observations per zip code, in a nonlinear model, you won't estimate the parameter that you're interested in, the treatment effect consistently. In a linear model, you will. So if you do the linear probability model and you put in these dumps, even though it's like a weird model and it will be off the support potentially, it will correctly estimate the parameter of interest, even though the nuisance parameters are inconsistent. So this shows up a lot in a setting, for example, where I put in a huge number of dummy variables, right? So imagine I put in zip by year month fixed effects when I'm looking at some sort of like default modeling problem. So I'm taking a lot of very fine grained cells where maybe I only have 10 people per cell. So those estimates are not consistent. And if I end up doing this in like a logit model or a probit model or some nonlinear model, that, that can cause serious issues in the estimation of my parameter of interest. OLS on the other hand has none of these problems. I mean, it has plenty of its own problems, but it doesn't have these problems in terms of consistency. So 
if you're doing something where you're doing, you have a binary outcome, you have a lot of fixed effects, and you think that you might not consistently estimate your nuisance parameters, do it in LLS. And when somebody says, why aren't you doing this in Logit? You say, well, we have a lot of fixed effects that we need to estimate. And because these nuisance parameters are going to be inconsistent, we want to do this using LLS where it isn't going to affect the consistency of our parameter of interest. I mean, you don't have to use those exact words, obviously, but that's the idea. Make sense? Any questions about that? That's kind of like a very important distinction in this. Okay. If I come to any of your talks and you don't do this, I'm gonna be, I'll be like, it'll be like a Christmas carol. I'll be like one of the ghosts visiting. The Sorry. ghost of the ghost of future consistency. Yeah, Alvaro, go ahead. Sorry. And this method of Chamberlain, uh, does it deliver also consistent estimate with short t? Yes. So basically the way that it works with Logit is that you're ending up basically integrating out the, the choice variables in this setting. So yes, it works with short T, but, but really it only works with these alpha I. You have to basically condition on, it's like the panel, the unit, right? The person unit that you can integrate out over it. Um, but yes, it's specifically works with short T. It works with, you know, T of two basically. Or three. If you have infinite T, you don't have to worry about this. I mean, so the, the point is to say like these nonlinear models, if you have very, very big T in a person, then you can consistently estimate them and it's less of a problem. This shows up in settings like, for example, where the you're looking at like link formation. So if you're interested in network modeling and you're thinking about um, modeling the the on off of say any of us forming a link connection say trading or friendship or whatever else or co-authorship networks there's n of us but there's n squared links and so that starts to be there's many more observations relative to the number of people so we can actually put in person specific fixed effects because the size of the observation set grows at you know, n squared rather than n, and so we have a lot more observations. That's like a, that's a, a paper by um, Brian Graham about that topic. Okay, so this is more of my like, this is, we're gonna end, conclude here on me just trying to sell this to you um, because I think this is really, and this might even, it's like for a Yale specific statement, Yale is like deeply, rich in people who are good at IO and know a lot about IO stuff. And so much of the discussion so far, we've done these IO style applications, but these types of discussions show up in a lot of other settings. So like Roy models, which are thinking about um, substitution patterns of how people would make decisions in say like labor markets. These have the same kind of choice probability issues where you're thinking about, well, how are my choices correlated and how do I choose my, um, my preferences across this? And when we discuss instruments and individuals' decisions to take up policies, if the policy is multidimensional, then these types of models are going to play a big role. That's issues that we just raised in the thinking about product choices are also going to matter when we're thinking about individuals' choices of treatments to take, for example. And, you know, think about when we were doing propensity scores, right? When we were doing binary propensity score. Well, if people are choosing between multiple treatment options, and this is exactly the same setting as doing, you know, multiple discrete choice, right? If I have three treatments I can choose, it's, I could do a multinomial choice problem in which I think about between the three of them and the substitution patterns between the choices are gonna matter a lot. So, thinking carefully about the counterfactual pattern is gonna give guidance in the more complicated IV setting. So if you think back to when we were talking about that um, propensity score setting, and I was talking about shifting the cost of a policy to get like variation in who's gonna take up a policy. Well, once I have three policies that you can take advantage of, think about the substitution patterns, right? So if I make one policy cheaper, Say there are three choices and all of a sudden what I do is I randomly vary the cost of one of the policies. I might wanna model the underlying substitution patterns because if you think about it, it might be that I get just a lot of people from choice three into choice two and not many from choice one into choice two as I vary the cost of choice two. So all these substitution patterns actually are very informative 
for thinking about things that are just pure applied micro and have nothing to do with IV, they're a really useful way of thinking about substitu substitution more generally. Um, you know, this is my view is arbitrage IO methods in, in other settings. So I think a lot of fields have discrete choice applications, but haven't really adopted the tools um, I think the cutting edge of IO tools is like a little overwhelming and quite complex, but even stuff, if you're using stuff from 10 years ago in IO, I think it's really can be very informative um, and a useful form of arbitrage um, in your own field if you can generate new insights using it. So I think of this Kojin and Yogo paper is like a, a great example of trying to arbitrage tools in other fields to gain new insights about um, finance, for example. Um, yeah, so that's it. Um,